athletic range. Continuing on here, going to focus today on short range strength. Okay, so why do we want to use these movements that are muscle dominant, that don't develop the connective tissue as much? If that's if if they don't develop the connective tissue, then why would we use them? And that's the question we're going to answer today. So Charles is really the, the guy who brought this uh, into the light. Uh, he brought my awareness to this topic. I didn't understand it. Charles never really explained it from what I, I've seen. I've never seen him explain this concept, but it was there within his arm training. And I think that you know we have to, to credit him and Ben and I both credit him very often for the influence and impact understanding that he's had on this concept. Um, I don't think, any, I haven't seen anyone take it to the, to the level that ATG has. And that is exactly why when I saw Ben's work in, 2018 i said yeah this is something special the world needs to know about this so the advantage that comes with this is being able to solve tendon issues to know where to start after an injury to be able to gradually uh, increase tolerance to total training volume uh, more safely to train daily without injury set up new potential for strength gains by neural drive increasing neural drive and you prepare for the long range strength work. Okay. So you're going to understand exactly how and when to use this to be able to be more dexterous with strength training. We know that strength training is a very powerful tool and we know that tension is really what's going to upgrade hardware and hardware dominant athletes are the dominant athletes. You want to work with someone who has the right hardware and then playing with the software is, is much simpler. If you have the wrong hardware, it simply cannot work. You you cannot have a high level athlete. If you have the right hardware, then other changes can be made. Okay, so we can have very connective tissue dominant hardware in, in someone like Stefan Holm, or you can have more uh, muscle dominant hardware like Charles's arms. Um, and you make your decision about where you need to be on that spectrum. But it's hardware dominance. It's tolerance to tension. And then from there, we can install whatever software is needed. Okay, we practice whatever movements are needed and, and great things are possible. Um, so we sometimes you just need this short range strength to be able to improve uh, performance. Okay, so it's not really optional to, to use short range strength and you'll see that it's not uh, the ugly cousin that it sometimes seems when we're talking about the benefits of long range and the adaptations to connective tissue and those sorts of things. Okay, so if we're going to go through the benefits, then firstly we need to identify you know, what would be the benefit of this exercise. It's going to train that shortened position. That shortened position might be really valuable for us if we are working really hard on a one-arm chin-up or we're working really hard on locking off and getting chest to bar the top of our chin-ups uh, because we're training the bicep specific to that position there's going to be a lot less connective tissue strain because the bottom part of the movement gets lighter and lighter and because the shoulder is uh, flexed rather than extended the tension is already taken off the bicep so it's going to require the muscle to do all the work it's not the work is not going to be done by the connective tissue okay all right so in this exercise, similarly, because the shoulder is already extended, then we when we extend the elbow, it's going to get that crampy feeling, and it's really the mind muscle that has to do the work. The connective tissue is not taking any of the strain. It's the body, uh, it's the muscular tissue that, that has to do the work. The connective tissue will still be loaded. It's still going to transfer force, but it's going to be dependent on how much force the muscle can produce rather than gravity already putting the connective tissue under tension. All right, so you might have seen the inner range hamstring work starting to come into ATG as well. This was always part of how Ben trained athletes when in his own gym when he had the machine of the kneeling leg curl. Charles was a huge fan. You know, Charles was always talking about how you need to have three different types of leg curl machines. But if you're working with a team and you know you have limited budget, you have limited space, I worked with a team with the smallest gym uh, in the NRL and one of the, um, but we were able to, to, you know, I think have the best program or at least the program that had the best results in terms of uh, on-field results. So we couldn't get those machines, but 
you can still get the benefits of this movement. Okay, so I was chatting with Ben about, okay, if there are people that are getting issues with hamstring tendons by getting really excited about going super hard at Nordics, we do want to be really great at the Nordics and some people will survive just going, you know, doing them really intensely. Some people will survive any type of training. What ATG is built around is for the people that don't survive any type of training, people who've had injuries um, and really to get the body back into balance with you know, how it was designed to be. Uh, so then a shorter range exercise for the abdominals, for the hip flexors would be something like the L-sit. Okay, So the muscles are already in a shortened position and then you're contracting them. Um, you see with the hamstring curl, the hardest part of the movement is going to be when the lower limb is parallel to the floor. Okay, so rather than in the Nordic, where a lot of the force is when the leg is relatively straight, it's getting harder here, and then the muscle becomes weaker. So getting above parallel is going to be much more difficult with the with the monkey foot. Okay, then uh, another example of this is the Patrick step up. Okay, so the ability to get through short range with a lot of strength is going to build this mind muscle connection all the benefits that we're going to go through okay so these are examples of short range movements some of them are going to feel more crampy some are going to be more extreme than others okay so to identify them you're looking for the crampy movements you're looking for um, movements that don't create a lot of soreness. Now, if you use them in the extreme, then you will get soreness. Um, and if you actually cramp the muscle, then there's you know, generally you get some soreness that comes out of cramping um, because the muscle kind of locks on. These muscles, these movements will generally require concentration because you're really having to connect the mind to the muscle to get the work done. Um, the opposition, rather than... In the long range movements, the fascia supports the weight and that's why it doesn't necessarily require as much concentration. When you're doing something like a Jefferson curl, the connective tissue are going to take, tissues are going to take a lot of the weight. So in the bottom of the Jefferson curl, you're, you're resting on the connective tissue where there's nowhere to rest in this movement. That's why you're switching on the whole time. That's why it can be neurally quite demanding and draining um, depending on how tight lower back is the hamstrings are okay so the restriction is the opposing connective tissue the opposing fascia muscle lengths in the opposing on the opposing side of the body <clears throat> so that's really what we need to be uh, thinking about with the extreme inner range is when we take it to the extreme if you're trying to get into a v-sit or even for a lot of people in the l-sit it's that tightness in the posterior chain that really makes us work hard. So the status quo here is for short range motion movements to be, well, actually this is backwards. <laughs> so they are overused, I think, in the upper body and underused, well, it depends on how you say. In the ATG system, it's probably the other way around. In traditional training, you would say that the upper body a lot of people won't use tricep kickbacks. They won't use spider curls um, and those kinds of movements because they think that they're not going to be big bang for the buck. So um, the pec activation exercises that I've been talking about, uh, even band pull-aparts are, are an inner range uh, posterior delt exercise. Then the lower body, people will tend to do partial squats. They won't go to full range of motion. You know, a deadlift is a partial exercise. Trap bar deadlift is a is a partial range of motion exercise. So it doesn't matter whether you're going from the floor or not on a deadlift or a trap bar deadlift or, a, you know, these, these movements. It matters whether the body could go further if the restriction of the, the floor wasn't in the way, right? And you could go a lot further with those movements. Therefore, they're partial, partial range of motion exercises and you're not getting tension from both sides of the of the joint okay so these um, overuse in the lot of short range of motion movements in the lower body is part of the reason why the lower body becomes very fragile um, and yes we could do with using them more in the upper body to increase mind muscle connection and you know for specific movements like the one arm chin up for example or the chest of our chin-ups strict 
Okay, so the muscle dominant movements, these short inner range movements, short range movements are more so using this winch type mechanism, right? So it's only going to move while you're telling it to move, while you're forcing it to move versus the elastic type component, the connective tissue component, the blue bar here, okay, that's when the tendon uh, and the ligament, the fascia is doing the work. This winding mechanism, the brain is doing the winding, right? So you're telling the muscle to do the work and that it's, it's creating the movement. The elastic band can't really be, it has very minimal uh, ability to be actively lengthened and shortened. The muscle can actively lengthen and shorten a lot more. All right, so we're talking about this winching kind of mechanism, ratcheting mechanism. Neural dominant, okay, so these, when we're talking about muscle dominant, we're talking about neural dominant, we're saying that it's really relying on the energy from the brain to the muscle, as opposed to those, uh, the, the long range movements, which use a lot of connective tissue tension and, you know, the resting tension of the muscle, and therefore we're going to have very different results. So just understanding this distinction, I might be sounding a little bit like a broken record to you. You're like, you might be like, oh, I said this over and over again. He said this in the other presentation. Most coaches haven't heard this concept and, you know, I want you to understand it and it to be second nature for you to, to sort of think about it, to, to be able to speak about it, to know exactly what you're talking about. Why would it be that the brain is so important in these? It's because there is no resting tension uh, in in the in the tissues, right? So, if this bicep is very short, and then we go and throw a ball and we explosively, you know, extend the elbow, then we can get this breaking. I mean, it happened to my father, right? So he wasn't training weights when it happened. He was throwing a ball for a dog, and uh, his bicep detached, and he has this little he had you know this little lump. He didn't get it reattached. How are we going to, you know, if you wanted to tear a muscle, if you wanted to tear a tendon, then obviously it's you really want to um, increase the resting tension. So you make the muscle as short as possible. If the muscle just stays like this and then you try and throw with it, then of course there's going to be huge amounts of tension in the connective tissue or the muscle. Somewhere along this chain, something is going to break, whether it pulls off a bit of bone on one of the ends Wherever the weakness is, that's where the issue is going to, to happen, right? So by understanding this concept of, okay, yeah, when it's straightened, all the, the, the there's a lot of tension on the tissues. If the muscle's actually shortened, then it's going to be close to breaking just by straightening it. Then if we put it behind the body, then if we put some load on it or we put some speed, um, then we can get this this kind of a result. And that's the way modern strength training is actually setting athletes up. So they're just going to have more trauma every time they train because even if they don't get that full rupture, they're getting more rupturing because there's more resting uh, tension because it doesn't know how to handle these, these lengthened positions, right? So the more we can train to handle lengthened positions and get adaptations in all of the passive structures, the tendons, the connective tissue inside of the muscle, the bone insertions, when they're all adapted, then we're going to be able to handle a lot more. Okay, so you can see that again here in this shortened position, it's going to be the brain doing the work. It depends on the joint angles here and obviously from the shoulder as well. But as we lengthen, the connective tissues are going to take more of the strain. Therefore, the muscle is contributing less relatively than the connective tissue, therefore you're going to have more connective tissue adaptation, right? If you're having more stress on the connective tissue, then obviously you're going to get more connective tissue adaptation. Where here you're going to have very little connective tissue stress. It just depends on the size of, of the weight or the speed that you're moving it at in these in this more shortened position. Okay, so the muscle dominance. Think about this applied to the hamstring. If we wanted to create hamstring tears, then we would only train the hamstrings in the shortened position, and we wouldn't apply a lot of load time in those um, lengthened positions, right? So then it's looking again like why would we use this short stuff? 
The muscle dominant movements are extremely valuable and extremely important. We just need to know how to use them, when to use them. And that is the ATG coach's advantage that we're sharing here. So find something you can do without pain and do a lot of it to bring life and neurological connection back into the area. So this is the one thing that a lot of people are able to do because we by doing this one thing, by you, you get to bring life back into the area, right? So if you if you can walk backwards, if you can drag a sled backwards, if you can run backwards, then you get some adaptation, you get the muscle switching on, and you get to move without the pain um, feedback loop, right? So it's very important to find things that don't cause pain and then do a lot of volume of, of those things. And by increasing the amount of stuff that you can do without pain, you find one thing you can do without pain, you you know, do lots and lots of that and then gradually do, you know, you'll find on, there are other things on the fringe of that that you can also do, right? So by doing concentric only, knee dominant, uh, you know, short range work for the quadriceps, then we will um, be able to, do slightly, you know, start to be able to handle the eccentric. Then we'll be able to start to handle the the split squat or the the VMO squat. This is just exactly how the ATG system is laid out. But now you know how to reverse engineer it. You know the underlying technology that will allow you to take it to any muscle group. Okay, so we need also these short range positions because they are specific to sport. Right, so we can't ignore them as much as we might fall in love with the end range positions, the short range positions also have their part to play, right? So you're going to get rewiring, increasing neural drive, increasing mind muscle connection. Very important. We're going to get massive circulation, heat and regeneration with these movements. All right. So when you're doing your sleds, you're going to get a lot of circulation into the area. Life brings life. You know, you bring a lot of blood into the area. You're going to find that the function increases. So you get those position specific gains. It's another reason why we need to do this. And there's a relative unloading of the tendons because the tendon isn't under stress already from the position as well as the muscle producing force. We tend to use these movements for really high reps. Uh, pauses work well with, with these movements. Um, Going slow on the concentric can also work well with these movements. So they can, they're concentric dominant movements. Um, slower eccentric is less important because we're not so much trying to load up the connective tissue. The connective tissue tends to take on the load when we go slow into long range movements. They also work really well for potentiation. Okay, so that's the system with ATG and the ability is to do short range movements before you do the long range movements and then you know you get crazy strong crazy bouncy uh, so the same principles can be used for our hamstrings for our biceps for our triceps potentiate with the short range and make everything feel really good and then go to the long range often if you go straight into long range whether it's with french presses or rdls or any of these movements they just don't feel anywhere near as good as if you've brought a lot of blood into the area, if you do inner range work first. So if you do the short range work first and then do the the stuff with uh, more fascial tension, you're going to get a lot better results. You can also use it after you've done your full range or long range work um, to bring more circulation into the area to start the recovery process. If we know that sauna, for example, has been used in the strength training systems, the Russian system, using sauna before and after, basically it's free circulation. So rather than having to do the sleds, you just get free circulation by the heat that's provide, provided by the environment. Now we can do that um, for ourselves by using inner range movements. Note that if you're only using these exercises, then you're going to shorten the fascia. So this would be the hip flexors of the crossfitter or powerlifters pretty much across the whole body. What you will notice with powerlifters is they can actually keep quite good uh, pec range because of their low bar uh, back squatting. 
And that's kind of one of the examples or exceptions. Now, triceps will tend to still be really short, um, but wherever the wherever we're using long range positions, then we'll maintain that ability. But where we're not, that ability will be lost. Okay, so the ankles, the hips, you know. Um, so this is the dominant paradigm at the moment is is using a lot of kind of like mid and short range movements okay so ben here working with mark bell what results are you going to get all right so questions that might come up now when you when you're looking at this eccentric versus concentric should we be focusing on the eccentric component in short range or concentric generally it's the concentric that we should be putting more f- emphasis and effort into. Initially, you can take out the, the eccentric altogether. In the lower body, it's easy to take out the eccentric with using sleds. Um, sleds also work for the upper body just fine. Uh, bands can also help to take out the eccentric component. You can use bands with the eccentric component, like when people are doing banded squats and banded bench and that. But you can also, if you're doing band pull aparts or if you're doing, you know, inner range uh, pec work, then you can just let the tension off uh, for the eccentric component. And because the weight's not going to hit the floor or it's not like the weight just turns to nothing when the tension goes off the band, right? So bands also allow us to, to work just with the concentric. And again, the concentric will put less strain on the connective tissue. So if we start with the concentric only work, we're going to bring more life into the area with less damage. And if it's shortened positions, then there's less resting tension in the connective tissue. Then that's going to allow us to bring circulation into the area without a lot of strain on the connective tissue. Um, So we can go, should we be going extremely heavy on these or should we be doing uh, light for lots of reps? Both can work. It depends on the goal. If you're potentiating, then you want to do that heavy, super heavy work. Um, if you're, so there's two ways you can pr- interpret this question. I'll answer it this way first. If if you more so for rehabilitation, then you want to go for super high reps. Um, but if it's for potentiation, then you don't need to go for quite as many reps and go a lot heavier. Um, when you are bringing life back into an area, it's also good to do some super light long range work, which could be static stretching um, or just, you know, very gently basically going into and out of a static stretch uh, without uh, any sort of speed or load, you know, would be a way to bring life back into an area to bring end range function. So you challenge the connective tissue a little bit, but not a lot um, after you've done your short range work, whether you do that very heavy or very high reps. Um, So number three, high tension, short versus long, right? So if you do, if you're jumping and things like that and you create a lot of tension in a shortened position, what's the impact of that going to be versus basically trying to jump into something like the KOT squat, sissy squat position or a knee extension or, you know, RDLs, drop catch style versus, um, you know, if you do drop catch style on with the, with the monkey foot on with the inner range work. So because the connective tissue is not already under length and tension, you would expect the body to tolerate a depth jump better than it would tolerate um, trying to jump in a, in a KOT position or trying to jump in the uh, human knee extension, right? So if you try to go really fast in those extreme long-range positions, then there's going to be more tension on the connective tissue. They're going to be even more connective tissue dominant. And it's likely at some point there you'll be able to cause some soreness to the bone or to the tendon. Um, So it's just, yeah, it's important to understand tension you know from the previous the previous uh, presentation and then also for understanding 
um, short and long. So where is the force being produced? If you look at, yeah, you know, it needs to be specific to the, the thing that the athlete or the person is trying to work on. And then you, you just have a better framework for understanding, okay, well, it's these positions that are causing trouble. These are the solutions. So if these are causing tightness, then why should we use them? People, you know, would sometimes say, hopefully you know how to answer that question, right? So if, if you're only training short and range of motion movements or short muscle positions, then you're going to, you're going to get really tight. So why should we use any of those movements? Why would Ben be getting Mark to do this movement if it's going to shorten his quads? If you, if you only train like this, you would get super tight, short, quads he would have strong patella tendons but he would have very short quads so hopefully by this point you know why you would use it to regenerate um because you need those positions for for, for sports um, in preparation for the long range stuff so that you tolerate the long range work and there are lots of reasons that we still need to to use it right to to rehabilitate to bring blood flow so it's not good or bad it's just understanding what the tool is what it does which i didn't understand for 20 years of working hard to become an elite strength coach and solve problems for myself now i have a much deeper understanding there's more possibility for for better results it's it's not the whole puzzle but there are definitely key things here okay so extreme short range is is another you know what about the movements where it's, it's really crampy? Like, should we take this to the extreme of like bicep curling behind our head, um, you know, with cables or with bands? Um, should we take it to the extreme of, of V-sit and trying to really touch the shins on the face? Uh, is that valuable? It depends on the goal, you know. It depends on, on what, you're, what you're trying to achieve. Um, children don't tend to cramp, and I think while ever we're becoming more childlike, it's a good thing. So as we increase circulation and health in the tissues, then they should become less crampy. As you do things like the L-sit and extreme inner range, you know, hamstring, calf work, then those muscles will become less crampy. My feeling is that that's, that can only be a good thing. So I am a fan of taking it to the extremes. You know, ballerinas have great extreme uh, short range calf ability, foot ability, you know, the plantar fascia, the muscles, intrinsic muscles of the feet have the ability to be in that shortened position. I think that that's, those are things that should be regained. The whole, you know, the whole system of human engineering, re rebuilding human ability, being more childlike, that's, that's what we're working towards. Um, so should I prioritize short, long, long, long versus, uh, sorry, should I periodize long to short? This, this periodization method does exist of like, okay, we're going to do full depth squats in the preseason and then we're going to do partial squats in season. There is some logic to it and it does kind of make sense. You don't want to cause as much extreme eccentric and connective tissue damage in season and potentially close to events. It's something that we need to explore further. Um, as is all of this, you know, it's all relatively, you know, new concepts that need further exploration. I don't think you can leave out either of them. So I don't really like the idea of periodizing them too much, but I do like the idea of periodizing intensity within them. Okay. So going really hard and heavy on short range movements closer to a competition would make more sense to me. And then using minimal load through the long range exercises, um, not really trying to develop them, but just maintaining the the ability to use those positions, be it splits or natural knee extensions, etc. We always want to, you know, keep those positions, but generally it will only take it will take less and less time to to keep positions um, as they become more normal to the body. Okay, so generally once a week, once a fortnight, some things will even only be once a month that they'll need to be used uh, to be retained. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some some thoughts about periodizing long to short. But generally, you want to keep it in. Um, it depend, yeah, for athletes, you can you can have a bit more dexterity with that around competitions. Um, so the long range work is going to work better after short range. Why is that? Because it's it's 
hot and cold. You know, if, if we're trying to make some change in this sword, then we're going to heat it up first, right? So if we want to change tissue, we should heat it first. So that's why we should do short range work before our long range work um, to allow the tissues to become more pliant, um, more pliable, compliant, whichever the word is. So I was listening to Matt Fraser talking to Joe Rogan and he talked about like tearing his lateral uh, lateral collateral ligament, I guess is is what it would have been. Um, you know, tearing the lateral ligaments in his knee while stretching them during a competition. I think he said it was at the CrossFit Games. My thoughts and suggestions, my theory around this would be that the connective tissues were becoming more lax because of the amount of work that had gone in, you know, heat and, you know, challenge to the body that had gone in before that stretching through all the work that he'd been doing, like it was, everything was becoming more pliable. Um, if you, yeah, if you sort of think about, you know, the woman's body going through labor, there's the contractions, there's a lot of shortening happening in that area, creating a lot of tension. And then, you know, the baby comes out. I mean, the contraction is, I guess, on the inner stuff, but that may not be a good example, but it may be as well. Like there's a lot of, warmth and energy being created in that area and then you know that's probably part as along with a lot of other hormones that get released during extreme effort whether that be giving birth or crossfit not that there's that similar but um i think yeah all of for all those reasons the long range work is going to work better after short range it doesn't really make that much sense you know to to you only want to go light with with long range stuff um, cold you know you don't want to go to high intensity so if we're talking about the, the scales if you watch the the lecture about the three scales uh then you know you only want to be doing sort of one two three type intensity you know mostly one and two uh, on the long range work before you've brought a lot of life into the area circulation so again i have I think this is really clear by now, but the vast majority of the strength and conditioning world do not understand this concept. The overuse of short and mid-range movements is doing massive harm to human movement. These movements create muscle-dominant athletes as opposed to connective tissue-dominant athletes, right? So there's a spectrum, there's a degree of, you know, connective tissue-dominant from the extremely connective tissue-dominant uh, guys, you know, maybe like Kadoziani, and uh, home, Stefan home. And then you have guys that are maybe, you know, more muscular, like a lot of the NFL players, you know, Cheetah and um, the thicker set athletes, but they still have enough connective tissue that they can, um, you know, that they're really healthy, but they maybe have better acceleration. And someone like Kato and, and Stefan home, they probably have, they would have had good acceleration, like they would have been fast, but they probably could have been faster by becoming more muscle dominant or bringing, you know, bringing more muscle into the equation. Now that wasn't their objective. They had time to build up to their, um, so they just needed extreme connective tissue ability for those last couple of steps that they were going into with momentum. But if you want to look at athletes, that acceleration is the key, change of direction, being able to run through contact then you need to come further along the spectrum towards muscle dominance. Um, but you don't want to go to such a muscle dominant extent that the connective tissues are weak and there's chronic issues around that, which is what is happening with modern strength training. So it gets worse when athletes get an injury because they then get rehabilitated from a muscle perspective and not from a connective tissue perspective. And then that creates this negative cycle. So, Often once an athlete is injured once, they will, if, especially if it's a lower body injury, they'll generally become even more upper body dominant in terms of their strength and muscle mass distribution. And the smaller muscles, particularly, you know, tibialis, calf, you know, soleus, foot muscles, all these muscles will tend to atrophy if there's a quad or a, or a hamstring issue or a knee issue. And so then it just becomes a long way back and often people never emerge from this cycle until they find ATG online or an ATG coach and, you know, they make, make a change. So 
If we can give the gift of athletic range strength, we can restore childlike ability and make people doing these movements not need to, you know, feel like they need to warm up or they're never going to be able to get back to, to doing what these people are doing. And what they're doing is jumping for joy. And it's, it is really a natural, joyful thing, um, that running and jumping and our strength training, our tension training, the preparation work that we're doing with people should bring them back to, to these abilities. Um, so that's our opportunity. We can solve tendon issues. We can increase tolerance to training volume, potentiate. We can prepare well for sessions and set up new potential for strength gains by increasing neural drive and neural density. This is a key part of the new era of strength. It's just better technology. It's better terminology. You can have a better dex understanding of what you're actually doing. We can reverse this ticking time bomb of modern athletic development where athletes become top heavy and neglect the muscles that are playing the biggest part in performance, right? So what's happened in the past is that the field work in itself, running and jumping, has done the job of the strength coach to keep things in balance enough. And if the strength coach builds the muscle dominance and then keeping the athlete, if the athlete's on the field, then they keep enough connective tissue dominance and it kind of works, but it kind of doesn't work and it's caused a lot of a lot of damage and a lot of harm. So uh, we've probably all experienced this and played our part in it. It's not about, you know, demonizing other ways of doing things. Um, you know, I've we've all used different methods and we've all made mistakes in life, but what we have now is a new opportunity of a deeper understanding of a better way to do this stuff. So, you know, we just have to do our best to share it with everybody, you know, share it anyone who's going to the gym, any coach, they need to understand these concepts and to be able to apply them in their own programs. And when they can, I think we're going to find that injury rates will decrease significantly, performance will significantly increase. Ben Patrick is a great testimony to that, as are many of you coaches. I'd love to hear your feedback on this. Ultimately, you know, this is about you. This is about creating the best coaches, a network of coaches where if Joe Rogan goes and trains with anyone in this network, if he's traveling around the world and he goes to an ATG TG gym um, or finds his local ATG coach through the app that, you know, you're going to do an amazing job with them. You understand exactly what you're doing and, you know, you know why you do what you do. If you are deviating from the exercises that are used in ATG, you understand exactly what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, rather than just doing something else um, that's cool. Um, so, yeah, I think that this is going to give us a much greater depth of understanding about the tools that we need to use. Short range is definitely a blessing. Uh, it's really all starts here reversing out knee pain, step-ups, such a huge you know, blessing to be able to do those movements and move into things like the split squats and the KOT squats. So I hope you enjoyed this today. Looking forward to hearing your feedback. And uh, yeah, have a great day.